Okay, are we alone? This is a question I'm sure all of us have asked at one stage or another. And um, when we ask this question, we usually think in terms of our conscious, self-aware life. But uh, we're going to think just a little bit more generally in the time we've got. And I guess the first question we have to answer is, what is life? And I particularly like this definition. It avoids all the issues of consciousness and self-awareness. A self-sustaining chemical system uh, capable of Darwinian evolution. Now, I think you all get the idea here that it's, it's not a simple chemical reaction which only works you know, in one direction, like putting copper in sulfuric acid or something. It's a more complex chemical system and it can evolve. So we'll leave that as a definition and then move on to what do we mean by life. And clearly, when we talk about living organisms, there's clearly a hierarchy of life from single-celled organisms at the top there to multi-celled organisms, and of course there is a sort of similarity between um, everything is built of cells, admittedly not bacteria, um, but uh, more complex cells. And then we get to the um, next stage in our hierarchy, the dolphin here, who I've definitely classed as conscious, and whether or not dolphins are conscious and self-aware, I don't know. And then the next stage I epitomize with the Greek civilization just to make the point that if the universe or the galaxy was full of civilizations who are clearly self-aware, self-conscious, communicating with each other, if it was full of such organ um, civilizations, we would know nothing about them because they essentially make no impact or any, only the most subtle impact on their planet. And so when we are talking about consciousness and self-awareness, we are clearly going to uh, talk about uh, a technologically advanced capable of communication from one planet to another. And in this sort of talk, there are so many provisos that, um, that when we discuss this issue that that is merely one of them. Now, what do we know about life? Well, we know that life on Earth is widespread and extraordinarily tenacious. And each of these environments is a place where we find life. Uh, Lake Mono has a very high level of natural arsenic, and yet there are organisms there. NASA gave a rather stupid press release thinking that uh, arsenic had been substituted for phosphorus in the chemistry of the organism. This was not too true. The cells were full of arsenic, but probably in, only in order to get the phosphorus. Colwellia, uh, an organism, and incidentally, these are all archaea, which are single-celled organisms forming uh, another group in the family tree of organisms. So a bit like bacteria, but uh, a certain type of bacteria. Colwellia thrives at, at minus 20 degrees, lives for 400,000 years in the ice, may even show some activity at minus 200 degrees. We find organisms at the smokers, at the centers deep in the oceans where the temperatures go above boiling point. In fact, this thing only thrives above 90 degrees centigrade and uh, temperatures at which we normally sterilize. Hot springs are notorious for their wonderful colored organisms. And the other place that we are finding evidence for life, this is the Beatrix gold mine in South Africa. It's only um, a kilometer, it's only 1.3 kilometers deep, this particular one, and you will see water coming out. This water is found by uh, that Sherwood and Sherwood Lola has found water aged, you can date the water at 2,000 million years old, the liquid coming out of the rocks in these situations, and they are indeed inhabited by um, bacteria, archaea. So life is widespread and tenacious. We're not incidentally saying that these organisms are 2,000 million years old, but we certainly find evidence for microbiomes at temperatures of um, nearly three kilometers deep in basalt rocks. So one thing that is very clear is that there is no way, there is nothing that human beings could do that would eliminate all life on Earth. Uh, we could destroy every blade of grass, every living, uh, every, you know, kangaroo, um, 
giraffe or whatever, and um, these organisms would still be present deep in the earth in all kinds of environments. So life is widespread and tenacious. We live in a universe perfectly suited to our existence. What do I mean by that? I mean that the constants of nature are very fine-tuned. The, um, the force of gravity is extremely weak compared to the electrostatic forces. The force of gravity between two protons is 10 to the minus 34 times the uh, force of re uh, electrostatic repulsion. And th this tuning has to be very fine because if the force of gravity was much greater, um, the universe, everything would have collapsed into black holes early on in the history of the universe, much weaker and no structure would have emerged, no stars, no galaxies, no heavy elements. So this tuning is clearly quite fine and we ask why is this? It could be there's some super theory that we've not yet discovered um, that predicts all the forces as well as the laws. It could be um, one of the current ideas of string theorists is that there are many, many universes and of course we only appear in the universe that is suitable for us to appear in and of course if you are a believer you may think that the universe was created by some superior being and that does still leave you with the problem of which universe that being exists within. Now, when we look at a galaxy, like our own galaxy, and you all know about galaxies, there are something like 100,000 million stars in an individual galaxy. And I think when we consider issues of life, we really have to confine ourselves to our own galaxy um, because distances are just too large otherwise. Within, this is a detail of that galaxy, amongst the 100,000 million stars, we see these red blobs these places where stars are being born. And these stars are being born out of these giant molecular clouds. This is the core of a giant molecular cloud with the stars are, are being born in the center and clearing the space around them. And they are called giant molecular clouds because they are full of molecules. And um, what you have to do when you look at this table is just admire the number of molecules rather than actually identify them. But there are three molecules that have been detected in, um, in the um, yeah, comet 67P and certainly uh, amongst those uh, is uh, the, the precursor methylamine and once those is the simple um, uh, um, uh, amino acid glycine is present there. So the building blocks of life are certainly present extensively in the, in the, um, in the galaxy and of course within the last few years we have been detecting planets and it could be that planets exist around all stars and we really have two ways of detecting planets uh, not uh, in very few cases do we observe the planet but we can observe the motion of the star um, uh, in, in the reflex motion of the star due to the presence of the planet about its center of gravity and that is one way of doing it and you can see that massive planets around low mass stars are more easy to detect than <clears throat> the other way around and the other way of finding planets is by looking it in a direction in space uh, and looking out for the moments when a planet passes in front of its star and its brightness dips. And I'm sure a lot of you realize this, that we now, well, uh, June this year, we had um, evidence for 5,000, over 5,000 planets. Now, this diagram shows planet mass up the left-hand side. It's logarithmic in terms of the Earth's mass. And you will see um, there, Earth is one on this scale. And this is distance from the Sun, also logarithmic. So there's Earth at 1, 1, and uh, going up to 10, 1,000, well, uh, several hundred times, 300 times uh, the mass of the Earth. We see Jupiter up there. Now, the interesting thing about this diagram, there are strong se obs observational selection effects uh, because we, um, there's a limit to the velocities that we can observe. 
uh, this green line will slide down in this direction as we get down to observing uh, speeds of centimeters per second uh, for most sensitive things. But um, we already see that Jupiter is in this region. It is amongst a sparser group of, of uh, Jupiters rather than the majority of or many um, objects seem to have far more massive Jupiters. So it already looks as though our solar system may be slightly unusual. So the other observational selection effect is the fact that when we look at the, um, uh, the planets moving in front of stars, um, we only got to observe for a few years. You have to go for three or four or more years before you can be certain that the object you're looking at is really um, a planetary eclipse and not just um, a variation in the star. So the case for life being widespread in the universe, I think, is pretty strong. We've got, uh, it's perfectly designed for life, it's full of the building blocks of life. There are many stars, there are many planets, perhaps one planet, uh, well, at least one planet, perhaps, in the Goldilocks zone for every star. And we know that life on Earth is tenacious. So I'm pretty confident that we will find evidence for single-celled organisms somewhere in our solar system in the near future. And this is the Jezero crater, and you see a river system coming in here with a delta. And uh, if we look at that delta in a bit more detail, um, this was back in August the 5th, there is a rover that is exploring this escarpment, this edge of the delta, and these are typical of the sort of rock systems that it's looking at. We see evidence for sedimentary rocks cross-bedding, very typical of a, a delta formation with sedimentary rocks. And where water has flowed, there is clearly a possibility of life. This is not the only place. If we go to the moons of Jupiter, both Europa and Ganymede um, appear to have liquid water beneath their surface. Um, here we see these frozen ice flows on the surface of Europa. Ganymede has the advantage of um, a magnetic field, which suggests a liquid core, which suggests uh, the possibility of things like smokers. So we could probably go straight to Ganymede with some of those um, Pyrolobus fumari uh, bacteria and seed it right away. Not that we do anything so irresponsible. If we go to Saturn, well, we have Enceladus, and uh, there it is in the middle there, and if we look at Enceladus, we see these jets of steam coming from uh, below the surface, caused by tidal heating from Jupiter, so nothing to do with the radiation of the Sun. And of course, Titan, as you well know, has these wonderful methane seas and the every possibility that there might be some life form um, living in these methane seas at minus 180 degrees centigrade or so. This is about 400 kilometers across. So the, it's probably a bit like the Greek islands cruising around those islands there. So we not only have places where bacteria uh, or single-celled organisms could easily live, but we even have a mechanism for uh, moving them around the solar system. This meteorite was struck off the surface of Mars and um, um, was eventually, after about a million years or so, uh, landed on the surface of the Earth. And we have done experiments that show it's perfectly possible for these organisms to survive um, uh, being broken off Mars. So we might um, uh, then agree that um, it seems this was said by Metrodorus 2,400 years ago, it goes against nature in a large field to grow only one shaft of wheat and in the infinite universe only one living world. And I think, of course, he was thinking of, you know, animals and things like that. So you might say we haven't come very far in the last 2,400 years, but just something seems to be true doesn't mean that it is true. And so let us just look and see what do we know about our Earth and our solar system. Now, the problem is we only have one example of an advanced civilization, and that is ours. This is one of those um, a military, American military weather satellite 
uh, at night and you show, see these lovely features um, like the um, population down the Nile Valley, the network of cities, uh, that'll be St. Petersburg, that'll be Moscow, and you will see how so many civilizations or towns line the coastline of um, the world. So, yeah, rather beautiful um, and an example of a um, civilization. Now, okay, so we have one. We orbit a star, the sun, a stable-ish star. In fact, one of the uh, results of the transit observations with with uh, uh, Kepler was that we find amongst F and G type stars like the Sun, our Sun seems to be unusually stable. Um, it, ha it clearly has less flaring activity, which is clearly good uh, for um, civilizations. There may always be a planet at the right distance from the um, from its star to have liquid water, but of course the planet has to have the right mass. Too small a mass and the core will have cooled, the magnetic field will have gone, and the surface will have been, uh, the atmosphere will have been stripped by its star without the protective magnetic field. Too large a mass and it may just be covered in liquid water. It may have too much hydrogen in its atmosphere. So the mass is critical. Um, and to a certain extent, possibly, the presence of a moon. Now, we have a massive moon comparable in mass to the moons of Jupiter, although Jupiter is 300 times more massive. And we think that um, the moon was created by a collision in the formation, early formation of the solar system, a Mars-like massed object might have collided with the Earth, stripped some of the Earth's mantle, and um, it all ended up mixed up, and some of it ended up in the Moon. So why is a Moon important? Well, it stabilizes the, um, the inclination of the Earth's axis of rotation, which only varies by plus or minus one and a half degrees, unlike Mars, which has no big Moon and whose um, uh, ax inclination varies by plus or minus 15 degrees over a period of about 5 million years. Now this may not be essential for life, but clearly a stable axis of inclination gives us a stable, more stable climate system, uh, which is perhaps conducive to the formation of um, advanced civilization. So maybe you have to have a moon. We also have Jupiter um, a little way out in our solar system and um, you may, some of you will maybe remember back to 1994 when we saw uh, the comet Schumacher-Levy 9 break up into fragments and over a period of days one fragment after another collided with Jupiter and we see the, fire, the sequence of observations with the fireball uh, rising um, and catching the sunlight. Why is this important? Well, we now understand that, um, that evolution is not a continuous process of development, but one of punctuated moments of great proliferation followed by more stable times. And what punctuates, gives us this punctuated equilibrium, uh, catastrophes that wipe out a lot of the organisms on the surface of the Earth, but not too many. And certainly Jupiter controls the movement of comets into the inner solar system. We also live in a relatively stable part of our galaxy, um, reasonably far out. Um, if we were much uh, closer, we would, um, we, would in, we would interact gravitationally with giant molecular clouds that might send streams of comets into our interior, and we might be more often exposed to the luminosity of a, um, a, um, a supernova explosion. The other and final thing is the question of how we make stuff. Now, um, our solar system has only been around for the last third or so of the history of the universe. And in the previous two thirds of the history of the universe, generations of stars came and went, creating the heavy elements, 
that were left over, well, appeared in the debris disk, in the accretion disk that formed the sun, and are the material of our planets and ourselves. So clearly the universe had to be running for quite a while before we'd made enough of these elements. So, you might say, there are things that make the Earth a little bit more special. Going against that Copernican principle, Copernicus moved the Earth from the center of the universe, and it's almost a principle of astronomy that um, our position is forever relegated. We now, we, we go around the sun, the sun orbits the outside of our galaxy, towards the edge of our galaxy. Our galaxy is in a very small cluster of galaxies with only one other major galaxy. We, we are on the edge of the supercluster. So what I'm suggesting is that maybe the Earth is a bit more special. Now what I want to do, and this, the point here, oh dear, we always run out of time, is to try and look at the history of the development of life on Earth. And you have to ask yourself, whether this is an inevitable trajectory, or again, there is um, some special pleading here. So let's move over this very quickly. This is the 4,500 million years ago, and this is today, and we don't have time to go into it in much detail. But for possibly from here, the very oldest rocks we see are about 3,800 million. The first evidence for life we see almost as soon as it was possible for life. And then the big mystery number one is where did this life come from? Mystery number two is why for so much of the history of the Earth, for 3,000, more than 3,000 million years, was there nothing on Earth except single-celled organisms? And it's only within the last 600 million years that we have seen multi-celled organisms appear. Um, sorry, yes, the last, uh, there we are. Um, let's look at that section. The last 600 million years, multi-celled uh, organisms appeared. It could be that it took a long time for oxygen to build up in the atmosphere and there to be enough oxygen that if you had a clump of cells, the cells in the middle would pick up the oxygen. And now we see first multi-celled creatures, land animals, the plant comp the, uh, continents were drifting back and forth, and then the emergence of the mammals. And you will see here these major extinction events, five of them, and a sixth one underway at the moment, due, of course, to us and what we're up to now. We think that um, this one was certainly due in part, if not in whole, to the impact of a large, uh, several kilometer sized asteroid, although at this uh, very similar time there were major volcanic eruptions in what is now India. Um, and we don't know uh, what the causes of all these were. We have our ideas. They may well have been any of these things or a combination of them. And there were also periods, some of these corresponded to major ice ages. So is this an inevitable trajectory? And of course, we sitting in this room owe our origins to the rise of the mammals, the demise of the dinosaurs. There were mammals around before this, tiny little shrews. They then um, took over, um, uh, dominated the world after that impact. And um, that brings us to the last seven million years or so, the first hominids. And again, we have to ask, is this an inevitable trajectory? We think we had the, our last common ancestor with chimps was about seven million years ago. Don't worry, I mean, all this detail just reflects the complexity and the wide range of skeletons and so on, nearly all of them found in Africa that were the precursors of the modern hominids, homo here. And then we start, we don't even draw lines between them. There is some effort to make a little family tree here. Um, and it was until quite recently we occupied the Earth with these cousins, the Denisovans, the Neanderthals, and the Heidelberg uh, man or, or hominid. Um, we're not sure. But clearly the emergence of cooking and the emergence of mind are two important things. 
Cooking enabled us to not spend so much time hunting uh, or so much energy digesting uh, protein uh, and perhaps led to the development of a brain and this mysterious emergence of mind. Uh, Darwin used a thought that mind was something, origin of mind, it was just a difference between humans and animals was one of degree. So we have more brain power than a dog or a cat, but essentially we operate the same way. This guy thinks there are fundamental differences between the mind of a dog or a cat and our own minds, our ability to manipulate mental symbols, to encode our experiences, imaginary and real, in, in, in symbols, uh, to create new technologies, combination of ideas, moral values, and the, and the capability for abstract thought to sit in here and contemplate the origin of the universe. Now, we know, we used to, when I went to, first went and studied archaeology in southern Africa, intelligence was the governing thing. The manufacture of tools, that was a sign of hominid activity. We made tools, animals didn't. But here's Betty the Crow, and we are a long, long way, maybe a hundred million years from a common ancestor of Betty the Crow. She wants to get some meat out of a bucket. She doesn't just use the hook, she makes the hook and hooks it out. So clearly there's real intelligence operating there. So um, intelligence seems to appear when it's needed. Now we look at the last hundred thousand years and we ask ourselves, is it inevitable uh, that a hundred thousand years ago we see evidence for ochre grinding uh, and uh, the making of marks 70,000 years ago um, and was it inevitable that if we were there then that we would be visiting the moon here. And it's worth remembering that during from about here to here, we were deep in an ice age. So all this took place in the last ice age. Now, I see Matt is coming in, but he hasn't stopped me talking yet, so I'll carry on till he stops me. So all I ask you to consider, is it inevitable that when we get to there, we will get to there? It feels like many, many steps. Was it inevitable even when the Normans invaded with their, you know, bows and arrows and swords and chain mail that in no time at all, certainly in the twinkling of a geological eye, we would be um, uh, flying to the moon and considering whether or not there is intelligence elsewhere, something ongoing, the SETI project, the telescopes that are being built, all looking to see if they can detect evidence for civilizations. Nothing found so far. Our best way of doing it today to communicate, we could communicate over a thousand light years with today's technology to send the signal, today's technology to detect it. These are, the, um, these are not being sent. This is what we're using to do nuclear fusion experiments, but nevertheless, it's possible and we are listening and looking to see if there is any signal, and there is as yet none. So why is it silent? Well, there are many reasons. Maybe we're the first to be technologically advanced. We're not listening in the right way. They choose not to communicate. And then uh, the last three here, which we look at very briefly, organic intelligence is short-lived, perhaps. This is something favored by uh, Martin Rees, who thinks that we will soon become, you know, electronic um, uh, artificial intelligence and so on will actually take over and radio emissions will cease, so we will not see radio emissions. In fact, they're already slightly ceasing because we tend to use optical fibers to communicate these days. My own particular favorite is that technological civilization is short-lived, something first addressed by Drake in 61 with his Drake equation and we don't have time to go into this but we can put some numbers in and if we assume that every star that can and those are only the, the stable stars that are going to allow civilizations to develop then we would think and a civilization lasts a, a million years then there'd be 200,000 of them in our galaxy at the moment but if it only lasted 100 years, there'd only be 20. So even a very optimistic estimate of the number of civilizations suggests to me 
in the, in the most simple-minded analysis that the problem may be that we have to be civilized for quite a long time if we are going to find be around simultaneously with anybody else. This is a, a one in ten uh, planets, habitable planets per star, the fraction on well, those that life arises, one in ten, they involve intelligent life, one in ten, and communicate one in ten. Well, one in ten is still quite a high probability, but and you could juggle around those constants. But what this is saying, bottom line, we'd have to be around on average for 50,000 years on average before we could expect to be around simultaneously with some uh, with another civilization. So that leaves us with threats to our existence. If we are going to stick around for 50,000 years, and remember the Chinese civilization is only about 5,000 years old, and we have been technologically advanced enough to send signals only for about 100 years. So, you know, we've got an awful long way to go. And I would suggest that the threats to our existence are ourselves, um, we could say what other threats are there if we want to be on this long, long time scale. Well, climate change, quite apart from anything we do or are not doing, climate has changed in the past on quite short time scales, certainly at the end of the last ice age, a hundred years or less. So we certainly have to come to terms with that. 100,000 years is a typical time scale for a supervolcanic uh, outpouring, which will affect climate, um, as would this sort of comet impact. And species lifetimes are only about a million years on average. So although we can take command of our own genome, there are many issues that we would have to face. Now, Matt is still sitting there quietly, so I'm just going to carry on. And, um, oh, no, he's got up. This looks <laughs> ominous. And, I, okay, I, 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 he's standing there. That's still, we're still safe for a few more minutes. So I want to take, um, well, let's just look. Here we have birth of the solar system. Here we are today. Well, we know what's going to happen in the future. Um, um, the sun's going to become a red giant. And we do argue about whether the Earth is evaporated uh, or just escapes, but uh, the last time I looked, which was a few years ago, the Earth was going to be evaporated. But in a, in a thousand million years, uh, because the sun is brightening, um, uh, the oceans will start to evaporate. But let's be optimistic. With today's technology that, and, uh, and uh, uh, traveling at the escape velocity of the Earth, 11 kilometers per second, we could, in principle, with today's technology, build a spaceship that could go into space and in a mere, well, just over a thousand million years, it could visit every uh, planet in our galaxy. Now, that's pretty implausible, um, but it is doable. It's not, it's, we don't, we're not invoking some, you know, warp drive or something crazy. We're actually traveling at the escape velocity, 11 kilometers per second, and we built ourselves a life-sustaining spaceship. On the other hand, let's pretend we completely screw up and smash everything to pieces and, and destroy all those living organisms. That only takes us back 600 million years, so we've got a chance to do it once, maybe twice over before um, the, um, the oceans evaporate. So there's good news and bad news, and I think on that uh, a little thought, I will stop talking and eat before Matt tells me to. So how's that for a try? <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.